like to uh, start by welcoming everybody. My name is Art Merriman. I'm one of the principals here at Carnegie. Really appreciate everybody coming out today. And our, our guest speaker, we're going to hear about the world of auctions and art mm -hmm. and antiques. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Carrie Penny is, I'm told, a real expert and authority in this um, <laughs> in this subject. And she is the, the business manager at Cowan's Antiques, which is actually the biggest, not in the country, but in Ohio. In Ohio. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Look forward to mm -hmm. it. see what you have to say. Great, thank Thanks. you so much. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. I, w I wasn't sure how big of a crowd I was going to pull, so I'm flattered that you all showed up to hear what I have to say. I will warn you, uh, my kindergarten teacher did tell my mother that I have diarrhea of the mouth. So I do like to talk a lot, um, but I'll try not to bore you and I'll make sure we have plenty of times for questions and answers because I find that's when we really get into the meat of things. So I work for Cowan's Auctions. Uh, we are located right on Miles Road, uh, the Cleveland office. We're the first satellite office for the company. We're actually based out of Cincinnati, so that's where most of our auctions take place. But up in Cleveland, uh, we've been operational for almost four years now, and things are going really well. Uh, so what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is a little bit about what I do and what the antique business and auction business is kind of going through right now. And I thought a great topic to talk about would be boomers to millennials because I'm a millennial but I work with a lot of what we call the boomers and we're coming up on what they're calling in the biz is the great wealth transfer of baby boomers making plans, making their estate plans, making plans for their antiques, their possessions, their homes and you know what they're going to do with that and they're looking to their kids who are millennials that I'm sure you all know we have a little bit of a different taste but it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how that uh, turns out. Uh, so I would be remiss if I didn't tell you a little bit more about some of the wonderful people that I work with because I'm just one piece of a larger whole. So these are our folks that are down in the Cincinnati office and they've been operational for almost 20 years. It's a little blurry photo, but they're much better looking than they are right there. Um, and we do a variety of auctions. So we have, this year we had over 40 auctions. Next year we're scheduled to have over 50 auctions because we're getting so much stuff. There's so much stuff coming onto the market. We've hired at least five people this year. Uh, we're looking to keep expanding. We have a number of signature areas that a lot of people know us for. Uh, so the first one I have here is American history. That's probably what most people, when they think Cowan's auctions, they think American history. And that's because Mr. Wes Cowan, that handsome gentleman there, who's our owner and founder, is on the Antiques Roadshow. And that's what he does is American history. <laughs> so when people have an item of some significance, they, tend, they go, I'm going to call that guy from the Roadshow. We had uh, a couple years ago now, the descendants of Meriwether Lewis of Lewis and Clark had his presentation tomahawk that made the entire voyage of discovery with him. And the family was looking at selling it, and they were a little concerned that it was going to go to an overseas buyer. And as a piece of American history, they wanted to keep it here. So they picked up the phone, and they called Wes, and they said, look, we don't want to put this up for auction, but will you help us sell it? And he said, absolutely, and we sold it for over a million dollars for them. So that's kind of, that's one of our big areas that people really know us for. And it, that includes everything from um, old letters, signed books, old photographs, the old kind that used to be on glass, the large plates. It's a really fascinating area that we get to see a lot of really great pieces of history. And in this area, a lot of peop, uh, pieces of Cleveland or Northeast Ohio history as well. Jewelry timepieces, that's another um, big category, and I put that one second because we actually have an auction coming up uh, on the 3rd. That's another one in our Cincinnati office, um, so December 3rd, but the catalog's up online. And we do everything from, you know, mid-century modern watches to, I had somebody here in Cleveland bring in a piece that turned out to be Fabergé. <laughs> So it was a piece that she had been the caretaker for this lovely woman and she had left it to her and she thought it was special but wasn't sure and she brought it in and we ended up selling it for $60,000 for her. So lots of little fun niches in that market too. Fine art's a little bit more of my wheelhouse. Um, I studied art history at Kent State here in Ohio and I got my master's in art history from Boston University. So if it's paintings, sculptures, drawings, prints, things like that, I'm, I'm a little more comfortable with that. If, if you've got some jewelry, I can tell you I like it, but that's about it. Uh, decorative art's probably what we see the most of. Um, you know, you got your Tiffany lamps we sell quite often. 
rugs, furniture, silver, and that's you know what we see most often when we're having this property transfer when I'm talking about the baby boomers trying to leave these lovely things in their home to the next generation and what's going to happen with that. Uh, military and firearms is one of our huge departments. Probably um, the biggest sales that we do, they usually run two days, um, mostly antique firearms, but we do everything up to modern firearms and we even had one auction that was all machine guns. So I, I know the, the important first three rules of firearms, which is uh, one, you always assume it's loaded. Two, this looks like a gun. And three, don't point it at anybody. So that's, that's all I need to know. Uh, modern art and design, I'll talk about a little bit later, because this is something that's an area of the market that's doing pretty well. We're trying to build up these sales. We're trying to get more of this stuff in, because this is what people are looking for. And then American Indian Arts, one of our largest departments, and we're probably the top in the country in this area. Um, Danica runs our American Indian Art Department, and we sell pieces all over the world. Funny enough, most of it is shipped to us from the Southwest, comes to Ohio, we sell it to more people in the Southwest. So it's, it's an interesting exchange, but that's one of the things that we're really, really well known for, it's really fascinating. I think I finally stopped sending her pictures of African baskets. But I just wanted to introduce you to all those folks because I wanted to stress that nobody's an expert in everything. And luckily, I've got all those people's cell phone numbers in my phone <laughs> so I can send them pictures of things. And then they know people who are experts on even more things. I wanted to pull a couple headlines from um, some articles that have popped up within recent years. Aging parents with lots of stuff and the children who don't want it. Uh, that was from August of this year. Stuff it. Millennials nix their parents' treasures. And sorry, nobody wants your parents' stuff. I actually keep printed out copies of these in my briefcase. So when I'm having to have that rough conversation about how the rug's probably not worth what it was in the 1980s, I have a little bit to go on. And you know, I mentioned all those different areas that we sell things in, and we're just one drop in the bucket. You know, we're the largest auction house in Ohio, sell things all over the country, but every major city has auction houses. You've got your smaller operations that do more of the, the farm kind of auctions. And if you go to auctioneer school, even if you're going to be working with us, they teach you how to sell tobacco and pigs. So everyone's got to learn all that. You also have um, this whole industry that's really <coughs> booming right now to kind of deal with this influx of stuff. You've probably driven by, I know I drive by probably three on my way to work, storage units. All they do is it's just more place for you to store your stuff. And there are people that we recommend if you've got to empty the whole house, you've got to do a house sale. So there's house sale people. There's antique dealers. There's people that'll just put stuff on eBay. There's um, vintage home that'll take your kind of broken, not expensive furniture, and they put some chalk paint on it and some cute upholstery. And you know, there's all these different ways that people are trying to deal with this problem because there's so much of it. And we, okay. you know, we sell you know, millions of items a year. So since there's so much stuff, I have to explain that there's not as much demand as there is supply. So part of that is due to my generation, we millennials. I've had several people tell me, oh, I'm sure your house is just full of all these great antiques. I'm like, well, not, not really. I've, I've bought a couple things at auction, but I've got a, a little bit of a limited budget. Um, and that's one of the main reasons is you have financial strains. If I had to say the average age of people that physically come and attend our auctions, I'd say it's probably in 50s and 60s. And that's when you know people have more disposable income. You've reached your maximum earning potential. You know, I'm not quite there yet. I'm looking at buying a house. I'm looking at paying off my student loans. I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to have some kids. Got to put some money away for college. And unfortunately, I'm finding out a very expensive taste. So everything that comes in, you know, I fall in love with the chair that's going to go for $10,000 and, you know, not the one I said, you know, just put that one on the curb. So I, I'm start, for starting to figure out just to follow my gut there. But there's a big financial strain to it. And another part that goes into that is if I think about my own home, for example, sure, I have some things that I bought a lot of things that my parents gave me. You know, things that were in the basement room that when my mom moved into a smaller house, she wasn't gonna need them. So I've got that hodgepodge. I've got some things I bought on Craigslist because I needed a couch and someone was moving and they had a couch. So kind of mixing and matching these things together and you know, it works. 
And then you have your differing tastes. A lot of people, when I tell them my work in antiques, people my age, they're like, oh, like that stuff my grandma had with the plastic over the cushions. <laughs> and oh, the, you know, there's, there's this idea of like, oh, it's old and stuffy. And there's not this appreciation for the craftsmanship that went into it and the, you know, the beautiful carvings you can see on some of this, you know, what we call brown furniture. And what people are really interested in now, which I kind of alluded to before, was what we call this mid-century modern furniture. So that's the stuff from the 50s and 60s. If you watch Mad Men, it's that kind of stuff in there. And they're looking for that, that kind of sexy vintage vibe. You know, the, the antique is too old, but the mid-century modern is old enough to be kind of cool and hip, but it's something that's still accessible. And if you look locally at the success of things like the Cleveland Flea, that's exactly what they're doing is, you know, they have the chrome leg kitchen table that people just go gaga over. And, you know, most people just have that in their basement that they do the ironing on. And that's just things change over time. Um, I deal with a lot of different people that have decorated in one style that they really liked. I viewed a woman's home that had bought everything top of the line, French, you know, 16th, 17th century, really nice stuff. And she bought it, you know, from an antique dealer, paid top dollar for it. And I had to tell her, you know, I might be able to get you half of what you paid for it because this just this isn't what people are looking for. The same goes with Victorian furniture. And we see that a lot. That was very popular for a while. A lot of people were buying this stuff up that has, you know, the nice delicate settee sets with, our, with all the uh, little carved rosettes in it, velvet upholstery. and. <coughs> We've emptied out a whole barn that was full of that, and I still don't think we got her half of what she paid for it. But, you know, unless we find it's in, you know, perfect condition, something that's really attractive, you know, one of a kind, those things still have some value. But there's, there's this idea that oh, I don't want what my mom had, you know, I don't want that. Like, you want to have your own style, you want to build your own home. Also run into a lot this emotional attachment and nostalgia. So a lot of people, you know, I would come into a problem where their um, parents or grandparents have passed away and they're left with having to liquidate the estate. And they say, well, you know, either they absolutely love this stuff. You know, my grandmother told me this was very good stuff. It was very important, very valuable. You know, they spent a lot of money on this. They went to a lot of antique shows and this is their life's work assembling this. And so they want to make sure it's in good hands. And on the other side, I have I wasn't allowed to play in this house at all. I couldn't touch anything. I just want it gone. So it's, it's a different relationship. And there's a lot of emotions that go into it as well. So there's a lot of those kind of minefields you got to make your way around, and especially if it's a situation where there's three kids and they all like one piece and they're you know fighting over who gets what it can get really hairy but you know not a lot of people my age are going to have the same relationship with their parents stuff that they had you know I, I see a lot of people that will bring something to us and they'll say my grandmother had this and she thought it was very important it was very valuable it's always prominently displayed in the china cabinet and then i say you know well you know, that's all well and good, but probably has more sentimental value to you than it does actual monetary value because, you know, this China set, they print, you know, they made them in factories. And so there's not a great demand for it. And nobody my age is buying China. So if you can't put it in the dishwasher, we don't want it. That's mm. <laughs> just different relationships to the idea of stuff. So my grandmother, still washes her aluminum foil to use again. And that's a different mentality. That's the Great Depression mentality of, yeah, you keep it, you take care of it. You, even if it's broken, you keep it because you might be able to use it. And it's a different mentality. Now, with people my age, I have a lot of friends that would consider themselves minimalists. They'd rather spend their money on travel, um, experiences, gadgets, technology, than they would on you know, having a nice painting. They'll get one of those digital um, frames that'll cycle through their photos rather than having a work of art. Or they say, you know, I'd rather, I just want to have 
uh, you know, a loft downtown, and I want to go out and have enough money to go have drinks with my friends and eat when I, whatever I want, and I'm not going to spend it on stuff. Like, there's not that sentimental attachment to it. Absolutely. There's also what we call the IKEA effect. So, who here has been to an IKEA before? Okay. Well, if you haven't been, IKEA makes it as easy as possible for you to spend more money than you want to. <laughs> so there's only one path through IKEA. And you walk through and you follow it and it takes you through, okay, well now I'm in the kitchens and then I'm gonna go into the living rooms. And you walk into one living room and it's not like if you go to you know, Home Depot or something like that, you go to the, the chandelier section and you go to the kitchen sink section. They have an entire room set up for you. So you walk into the room, it's got the sofa, the end tables, the lamps, like coasters, every little knickknack you could want in there, and everything's got a tag. And you just go, well, I like this whole room. Rather than putting it together myself, I'll just take one of each. And then when you're done, you go to the end and you give them your tags and they take out what you want and you've got yourself your whole dining room or your whole living room. It's all put together, you don't have to think about it. And you didn't pay that much for it. So if you do end up ruining it, and all this stuff's made out of compressed, you know, board anyway, so don't get it wet. When you're, you know, when you get that job in California, you just put it on the curb, no loss, and spend that much money on it. And I've even seen, I'm surprised, looking through, you know, lifestyle magazines like Better Homes and Gardens, and they always tell you where you can buy everything. It's half of it's IKEA, you know, and it says they've made it so easy. It's easy to fall into. So they're, they're, you know, they're not selling the stuff that we're selling. So one of the things that has made a huge impact on the world of antiques and auctions is changes in technology. So it's been for the better and for the worse. So for us, as far as for the better, we sell to people all over the world. We can have a picture, um, a beautiful painting, we take a picture of it, we load it onto our website, and somebody in England can look at it, can want it, can bid on it. They'll, they can send us an email and say, could you show me X, Y, and Z? Take a picture on my smartphone, send it off to them, they've got all the information they need, just like that. You know, they didn't have to wait to get a printing catalog in the mail, look through it, make their notes, and talk to me on the phone, I can do it right away. Another thing that has really helped that, us is that with our marketing, we can just reach that much more people. We're not looking at just being in Northeast Ohio or everywhere. And the amount of information that I can get my hands on like that, I was just talking to a gentleman this morning, says, I've got this collections of paintings by this guy, Joe Schmo, and he goes, have you ever heard of him? I said, no, but give me a second. Go to the internet, I go to my arts database, I type in Joe Schmo. Sure enough, there he is, I got his birth date, death date, I got the last 10 paintings that have been sold by him. I've got all that information right there. I didn't have to say, okay, well let me go to the library, look it up, I'll get back to you. I had all that information right there. So it's been great and you know, I'm constantly learning new things. I am always looking for more resources for information. There's a Facebook group for everything you could ever want to collect. Um, I'm in the antique toy collector group, the antique train. There's one for antique cookie cutters. I'm, I'm in all of them because those people know what they're looking at. But then on the downside of now having all this information right at your fingertips, what we thought was really rare turns out not to be that rare anymore. So I did an example, I went to eBay and I just typed in a, a Royal Dalton Old King Cole. So these are three of the exact same thing um, from August through September, like a two week period earlier this year. So if you didn't have the internet, maybe you came across this in an antique shop, you've never seen this one before. You know, you've been looking for them, this one's really unique, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna pay a lot of money for this. But now, you just go to eBay and there's, you know, and this is just three of like four pages of results that I got. And one of the areas this has really hit is the antique book market. So, and that was another of the same thing. You had, the, there's only three copies of this. You know, it's first edition of Huckleberry Finn. This is the first printing because it's got this typo on this page. I know it's this one. And you know, I'm gonna pay $15,000 for it because there's only so many. 
Now there's databases, you just type in Huckleberry Finn, put the date in, put the first printing, and boom, you got listings of book dealers all across the country. So that's drastically dropped a lot of things in the market, because you just thought they were so rare, and it turns out they're not. <laughs> so we, we constantly find that we are trying to go through all this stuff and separate what we call the best of the best and then the rest. So then there are still pieces that can do really, really well. You just have to figure out kind of what's more common and then what's really exceptional and rare. So I wanted to put together an example. I've got two pieces of furniture that we've sold um, within the past couple of years. This one we sold earlier this month. Kind of a, kind of a similar looking piece. Um, you've got, uh, this is what we call a bookcase secretary. So you can store your books up here. Kind of the same on each one. You've got your graduated four drawers on the bottom. You would, this part comes down so you can write on it. So there's two pieces of furniture. Look, look pretty similar. This one's even got a cute little bird on top so they're a little bit different. Um, but let's see what the prices are on them. Yep. So there's a little bit of difference there. Yeah. About half a million dollars for this one and just shy of $2,000 for that one. So they're still really exceptional pieces across the board. And what made this one so special is this is the first known piece of furniture made in Kentucky. We knew exactly who made it and this was sold in our Cincinnati office, which if you know your geography is just across the river from Kentucky. So we had a number of people that came in and bid on that. It was pretty exciting. But it's, it's finding those really exceptional pieces and those really exceptional things. I see a lot of artwork by Cleveland artists, which, you know, from the 20s and 30s, which I love. But I have to explain, you know, this guy was really good. And this guy was just okay. <laughs> and this guy got to exhibit in a lot of shows. He was known internationally. And this guy just, you know, he went to art school. You know, I went to art school too. No one's going to buy my paintings. So this is a little bit of a difference. You know, we, we see that with everything. There's a lot of things that can make one piece more valuable than another. Um, first and foremost is what condition is it in? You know, I'll talk to someone on the phone and they're telling me, oh, I've got this great, you know, this great piece of furniture. I want you to come over and see it. It's really rare, it's antique, it's really old. And I get there and I start taking the drawers out to see how it's built. I said, well, I can tell this was made by a machine just by the way that it's made, so it's, it's not that old. And you, know, you start kind of picking it apart, and especially with furniture, what Wes Cowan has told me, he goes, the first, when you look at a piece of furniture, the first question you should have is what's wrong with it. And that he's taking me through a whole room of furniture and go, okay, what's wrong with it? And it's just, you just get used to looking at it after a while. You, you should know that th this should be higher. You know, this sideboard, someone's cut the legs. They've made it shorter. Or this is, something doesn't add up here. Oh, well, that's because this is made from two pieces of furniture that somebody put together to make one piece. And so when you really start looking at it, you're like, okay, okay. And I'm, and, you know, I'm the person that I come over to your house and I'm crawling on the floor and I'm looking at a flashlight beneath everything. So I'm, I'm really looking to see what's going on there. So I thought I would go over just some some tips and some do's and don'ts. Um, if you have a lot of things in your home that you are worried about um, passing them on, keeping them in good shape, kind of what you should be doing for planning. Uh, the first thing is to get up to date evaluations. I work with a lot of collections and estates that I'm handed a stack of paperwork from I got this professionally appraised in 1975. And that's not gonna help me very much. <laughs> So I, I literally have an evaluation from 1975 on my desk. Um, and you want to make sure you have somebody that is qualified to be looking at these things. Make sure that they are what they say they are. Um, you don't actually have to get any sort of special certification to call yourself an appraiser. Um, anybody can go hang their shingle up and say they're an appraiser. Uh, but there are some guidelines that they need to follow um, in order for your appraisal to be used for tax purposes or if you're using it um, for you know, legal purposes in an estate. And they should have gone through it as a certain kind of training. It's called USPAP. Um, so they should, have, they should be compliant with that. And the good ones do advertise that. And they will say that's what they do. Um, so you want to make sure you get that done regularly. Um, you want to talk to your family, too. I work with a number of people that they say, you know, I just want to make sure 
that when I'm gone, there's not gonna be a bunch of fighting. So what I wanna do is I wanna get a dollar value on everything. So then every, you know, if someone has a real attachment to the dining room table, you know, then they deduct that much from whatever everyone else is doing. So talk to people and figure out what they want and maybe they don't want anything. So then maybe during your lifetime you wanna say, you know, my neighbor really likes this piece. You know, I was gonna leave it to the kids, they don't want it. You know, she, she always comments on it when she comes over. You know, have those conversations and it can be kind of awkward. I've, I've had it with my mom and I told her, first of all, you gotta clean out your basement. I'm not, please, I don't need my cut and paste worksheets from first grade. I don't need it. <laughs> Um, and then you want to make a plan. Make sure it's all written down, your intentions are clear, um, so that there's no discrepancy about you know, what you want to do. Because people are going to try to figure out, you know, what, what can I do that is what they would have wanted and align with their wishes. Make documentation is a big one. If you bring a piece in to Cowan's Auctions and you have me look at it, and I tell you, ah, that's a such and such vase and it's probably worth this much. You just write that down and you stick it in the vase. So, you know, if something happens that, you know, you, you don't have a plan, you at least have that little documentation. And anything that is really important to you, you should put a note on it. I mean, we've had paintings brought in and I turn it over and there's a little envelope and I put us a little letter about when they bought it and where, you know, where it came from, who's the artist, why it was important to them. And that can help a lot when, you know, it gets to the point where there's an estate that's, you know, trying to make sure that things are being done correctly. And it makes my job easier too if I can't read that artist signature. If someone said, this was our neighbor, he was a great painter, and like, it goes a long way. And then take care of what you have. Um, <laughs> I've seen this floating around the internet. Don't try to clean your own paintings with a bagel. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who thought that was a good idea. Um, if there's something that um, does need to be taken care of, does need to be clean, um, you know, there's professionals that do that. Um, we've actually held events in our gallery where we have people from the Inner Museum Conservation Association come in, and they say, okay, here's you know the best way you can treat. Um, you know, what should you? How should you be? storing uh, your wedding dress if you still have it. A lot of people got them hermetically sealed and that's actually really bad for them. So that's one thing you might want to think about. Um, old family photos and letters, um, are they in a cardboard box in the attic? Well, you know, we hope not because we love those cardboard boxes full of letters. We had a woman come in and she had two banker's boxes. And the first one, just, this is, you know, this is the really good stuff. This is my silver and yeah, just, I'm just ready to let it go. And, I had to tell her that it was all silver plate, so you know, not the same as sterling silver, so her expectations were kind of dashed there. And then the other box was you know, a box of letters she had in her attic. She said, these are my family correspondence. I don't know what they are. I was gonna throw them away, but I thought I'd bring them in and let you guys have a look at them. So reading through these letters, and I, I worry because they're not teaching cursive anymore, and these are all in cursive, and they're hard enough to read as it is. And we're reading them, and we're like, oh, oh, wow and they're documenting the capture of Sitting Bull by someone who was there. We said, well, you, can t you should take your, your um, silver plate, keep that, and then this, we're gonna help you find a home for it. So we ended up um, arranging a sale to the Army College for her for that. So she had this great collection of letters that are now in an archive and they're being correctly stored and cared for. Um, in an acid-free environment. And I would say too, um, it's a project that I'm working on with my family, I have a great uncle who's 94, uh, he's just starting to lose his sight, but we've got all these pictures of you know, him around World War II and he's around a, a group of a bunch of people, we don't know who they are. So you know, we're having him sit down and say, you know, who are these people? I'm gonna write it down in the photo album so we know who they are. So it's just good to have that documentation Take care of what you have. Um, one of the things the folks at the ICA told us and they asked, you know, how should I be taking care of my furniture? They said, just a dry cloth, just to wipe the dust off of it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to get lemon pledge. You don't need to do anything else. Just if, it's, if there's a little stain on there, you maybe dampen it a little bit. But they said, the best thing you can do is just wipe it off with a dry cloth. You don't want to be that person on the Antiques Roadshow that brings your piece in. And they said, well, if you hadn't used bleach on it, it would have been worth you know, $3,000. But so just taking care of what you have and making sure that you are letting people know what's important to you. And when in doubt, you can just call me. I, I put this up here because I'm uh, fresh out of business cards. But if you have something and you're like, 
I don't know, should I, should I keep this? Should I get rid of this? You know, just we provide evaluations free of charge. Um, just let, we'll let you know if it's something that, you know, yeah, you, you can go ahead and put that in the yard sale. Or, you know, you want to make sure that this is, you know, documented that you have this and it's insured. We're always glad to do that. Um, you know, go, go through the whole house if it's an estate or anything like that. So that's, that's just a little bit about what I do and what's going on in the world of art and antiques. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions and I, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. Any takers? Don't be shy. <laughs> I was that thorough then. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, some some Ali can do really well. Um, you have to be careful because there are a lot of um, Austrian fakes. Well, yeah. Uh, they even sign them. It can be very hard to tell. Um, you can actually shine them under a black light, and uh -huh. you can tell the difference in the quality of the glass. And if you have, and you can tell when you look at it, um, just the quality of the work, right. um, if it's real or not. But we sell a lot of La Lique, um, La Lique and Stu Ben. Still very collectible, um, but yeah. you know, usually we end up doing like a small grouping, unless it's you know a fantastic vase or. We had a beautiful, um, what's called a peruche vase. It's got the little lovebirds all over it. Yeah, we, it was beautiful uh, ruby red, but someone had drilled it to make it a lamp, which uh, did not help the value there. But yeah, La Lique's something that's still very collectible. And we even had a piece um, in one of our auctions that went way above our estimate. And so we called the person that bought it. We said, what did we miss? And he was like, oh, well, this, you know, this color for this pattern is very rare. So there's all sorts of little niche things that I've, I have a woman I call in if we get dolls or toys. I actually have a collection of antique teddy bears that they all look like gross old stuffed animals to me. But she said, oh, no, no, this one right here, it's an old Stife teddy bear. She said, okay, this is about 1905. And the way it's put together, it's got a seam going down the middle of its face. And she's like, that's very rare. She said, this is probably a $3,000 teddy bear. So and I've, I've got a guy that just does old bottles and flasks. <laughs> so we try to make sure we have everyone for their little niche market. But yeah, art glass is still very collectible. Mm -hmm. Yes? I missed the first five minutes coming in. <laughs> Did you talk about how the auctions actually work? No, I didn't, uh, but I can. Uh, I would be glad to detail that. So we offer a couple different style of auctions. Um, as I mentioned when I was talking about how great the internet is for when we're trying to sell things, um, all of our auctions do go up online. Um, we have live auctions, which I brought a couple catalogs as examples of those type of auctions. So we do a printed catalog for that. Um, we have three auctions in the Cleveland office, and then the rest of our auctions take place down in Cincinnati. So you can come in, you can get a paddle. Uh, we'll have a preview. So that's usually um, the week leading up to the auction. And if you are considering buying something at auction, you should definitely go to the preview. I can't believe how many people buy things without having seen it in person. You want to go and look at it and make sure it's, you know, what we say it is because, you know, we're human and we make mistakes. And, you know, usually I have that person that calls me that tells me about the Austrian fakes of La Lique. So that's, you know, that's how we learn. But we do the live auctions and then some that are just online as well. So those ones, um, we have a couple listed online right now. And um, everything just, you can sit right there at your computer in your pajama and bid on them. Uh, so you just come in, you register, as long as you're in good standing with us. Uh, we have a problem with a lot of Chinese buyers buying stuff, buying and never paying for it. Um, so as long as, yeah, as long as you're in good standing with us, uh, you'll be approved to bid. And then um, the way that the kind of pricing of everything works is what you often see is a hammer price and then a price realized. And so the way that we get paid is we work on a commission. So unlike a dealer, I'm not trying to buy it for five bucks and sell it for 5,000. You know, I'm gonna take a percentage of what it sells for. So depending on what it sells for, we generally work anywhere from 10 to 25%. And then on the buyer side, they also pay an additional buyer's premium, kind of like a finder's fee. Um, so that's how that works. So if you're gonna buy something at auction, make sure you know what the buyer's premium is, because just because he says, 150 sold, you're not going to pay 150. There's a little bit more on top of that, and that's that's standard across the auction business. So you said there's the hammer price, and then there's the other. What is the? And the other one's called price realize. That's usually the one we advertise because it looks better. Uh, that includes that um, fee that goes to the buyer because the buyer did pay 
that total amount for it. So they knew that going in when they were bidding on it. So that's the one that you'll see is the price realize includes that buyer's premium, that additional fee <coughs> to the buyer. Mm -hmm. Yes? Your opening statement about the young people downtown and so forth. Mm -hmm. Who sets the values that you're talking about here? That's a good question. Um, so the way that we base our values, there's a couple different things that kind of go into that. And the first thing that we do is we inspect the piece to make sure it's in good shape. Um, if you know it's a piece of furniture that's been refinished, that's going to be um, it's going to affect the value. If it's a painting uh, that has what we call in painting, so old paintings over a while, the paint starts to flake off. They may have taken it to a professional who kind of filled it in, we can shine a black light on it and see that they've been changed. So depending on the condition, <laughs> that'll affect the value, um, especially when you're dealing with art, the general aesthetic of the piece. It could be a well-known painting by you know, Picasso or somebody, but if it's not a cubist painting, that's not what he was known for. That's what people want. So what we do is if it's, you know, it's a painting by an artist, it's a certain type of furniture, um, it's a certain gun, it's um, you know, anything like that, we have databases that track auctions internationally. And we can log into them and I can say, okay, I've got an oil painting um, by Renoir. What's the, what, what'd those sell for last time? And I say, okay, well, paint his paintings of you know, little girls that are about this size, this is what they sell for, and I kind of come up with a rough estimate. And so we do try to keep in mind, you know, somebody's looking at, if it's a large piece and it's somebody that's going to buy it online, it's going to be a shipping cost to it. Um, Want to figure out if it's a painting that maybe could use some cleaning. You know, painting's perfectly fine, but you know, it's in the home of a couple of chain smokers and it's got that nice nicotine film on it. You know, someone's going to say, okay, well, if I buy that, I'm going to have to get it clean. So there's a lot of different things that go into it, but mostly what we do is see what things have sold for over the past couple of years that kind of show us where the market's going. And that's something we've seen a lot with Chinese art. Chinese was just through the roof, hot, hot, hot. We couldn't get enough of it to sell this stuff. And it was the little things, you know, the little snuff bottles and things like that, because their market's so volatile. Chinese don't believe that their money in China is safe at any time the government can take it. So if they have little things they can put in their pockets that they could then turn around and sell for money, that's something that's really valuable. But then if things start to get better, that market goes down. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. Do you find the, uh, there's still a great deal of interest in antiques and so forth? Mm -hmm. The younger mm -hmm. people, are they interested? <coughs> you said, you mm -hmm. know, uh, don't give me your uh, old furniture or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, we see majority of our people <coughs> that actually come to our auctions and attend them are probably in their 40s or older. We're trying to cultivate that younger audience and we see that more with our auctions that have that mid-century modern furniture I was talking about. You know, and it's, it's something that it requires an education and an introduction to it. So we offer um, programs at our gallery that we just call Auction 101. And it's, you want to come and buy something at an auction, you're nervous, you've never done it before, you don't know about the buyer's premium, you know, we, and we have people come in and we show them some of the stuff and we say, okay, well, here's a painting, here's what you should look for in a painting. Here's some furniture, here's what you should be looking at. And the, you know, kind of teach them questions they should be asking and, you know, questions that they should ask to make sure that they're dealing with someone that's reputable. You know, every, everyone makes mistakes. Um, if it's we sell something and it turns out it's not what we say it is, we'll, you know, we'll give you a hundred percent, you know, guarantee we'll give you your money back. Uh, we've had people try to sell fake stuff uh, knowingly through us um, that was brought to our attention, and you know, we luckily pulled it out of the sale before we had to deal with that. But you know, that, those are just things that happen. But th I think it's picking up a little bit. But I think it's we don't really know where it's going to go. I mean, you know, I talk to people that have these beautiful rugs that they bought in the 90s when the rugs were really hot. And now it's like, no one has room for that. You know, no one has room for this palatial or room size rug or case clocks. Um, we work a lot, work a lot with um, Martine's Antiques. They have those great case clocks in there. You know, ten to $15,000 on them, I'll, I'll probably sell them for 800 bucks. Like, it's just, you know, it's just the market's not there for them. Grandfather clocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing. Yes. Martin's going out of business. No. 
Oh, you just try to sell their stuff? No, they recommend people to us oh. um, if they because they do pretty much like silver and clocks. Um, so if they're working with somebody who has a clock, but they also have like some dining room furniture, they'll send some stuff to us. And then if we have somebody who doesn't want to wait for our auction or has something that's you know they want to put something in a retail setting and you know it's kind of in their area, we recommend them as well. So mm -hmm. yes. So what's going to happen to all of this china and crystal that? <laughs> that's that's the big question. Um, <coughs> We often find um, sterling silver flatware. <coughs> Most of the sterling silver we sell is going to, we have a handful of individuals that we know for a fact are buying it to melt it. Uh, they're buying it on prospect, waiting for it to go back up to $40 an ounce. Mm -hmm. So if you look through all of our catalogs, anytime we have a piece of silver, included in that is how much it weighs. Because that's, that's what people do, they'll bring a, a scale into our office and they'll just sit there and they weigh everything and then they figure, okay, well this is how much I can get for it. So that's, that's what's happening to that. Unless it's really exceptional stuff, mm -hmm. Tiffany, Gorham, big English pieces, Sterling Center Bowl, those are still doing really well. China, I almost never recommend that they try to put it at auction. Um, it's cumbersome. You're not going to have anybody online buy it because then they're going to have to pay to ship it. Um, it can be very difficult. We do sell it um, from time to time, but that's just not something that people want. And I think most of the people that are buying it, you know, are either buying it to put it in their antique shop and, you know, maybe it'll be sold. Or I think a lot of people are kind of upcycling and crafting with a lot of things. Like we have an online sale right now that's got a bunch of groups of just mismatched teacups. And I'm like, well, I can see someone buying that and making them into candles or something. But, you know, it's just there's so much of it and nobody has any intention of using it. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen to all of it. Might end up going to the landfill. And the crystal? <laughs> yeah, the crystal's about the same thing. Um, so we have a really nice set of Gorham crystal that we put up for auction and we got zero interest in it. And it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to sell. You said the dirty word, landfill. That's exactly what I was talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yes? Do you ever find that unusual piece that really belongs in the museum? Do you ever suggest to someone this really shouldn't be sold, it should be, you know, mm -hmm. given to the museum? Um, it depends. Um, like the special situations where I was talking about like the Meriwether Lewis Tomahawk or the, the collection of letters that we actually facilitated a sale to a museum. We work with collecting institutions a lot. Um, usually it's when they're kind of thinning out their collections because they really only have so much space. And um, when I used to work at the art museum, I would answer the phones and all day, every day, it's people that want to give stuff to the museum. And while they're glad that they're thinking of them, you know, especially with the Cleveland Museum of Art, they're, they're pretty special in that they're in encyclopedia collection, encyclopedic. So if they have three George O'Keeffe flower paintings, they really don't need another one. So they're trying to have really good examples of one such thing. So if somebody calls and says, well, I have this great violin and I want to leave it to the museum, they're probably not going to be interested in that. And in fact, a service that we offer with a lot of the um, collecting institutions, especially the smaller historical societies, is that if someone wants to give something to the museum, but it's not really in line with what their collection is all about, we'll sell it for them and we won't take a commission and then all the proceeds go to that nonprofit. Um, I can't say I've ever seen something that was that spectacular that I thought it should go to a museum. Usually people know at that point. Um, but if it is something that we think would align with a museum's mission, we had a great map in our um, auction in October that was of the Western Reserve, you know, an antique hand-drawn map. Um, and, you know, we, we had a duty to our seller to sell it, but, or our, yeah, our seller to sell it. And we told the Western Reserve, we said, hey, I just want to let you know, we have this, you might be interested in it, and if they want to make an offer before it goes up to auctions, sometimes we'll do that as well. But usually most people, when they come to us, they're looking to get the best money they can out of it. Any other questions? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You've been such an attentive audience. So thank you for listening to me and what I have to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.